Hello again. This lesson we are going to go back to some of the algebra that we've learned and work on rearranging formulas. The applications that you've done and the things that you'll encounter, of course, in the future will involve a lot of formulas. And sometimes the formulas are really handy to use. And the thing that you're looking for is isolated on one side of the equation. And all you have to do is fill in the numbers on the other side and use your calculator and you get what you want. And other times you have to get something that's not isolated out of the formula. And we did this a long time ago using some algebra. Just like before, you fill in all those values in the places where they belong, do a little algebraic work, and you get what you want. And this is great, unless you need to do this a lot of times, in which case it might be handy if you were able to create a new formula so that the value you needed dropped right out all by itself without the algebraic manipulation. So that's what we're going to do. You'll need your calculator for a little while and your guided notes. And so let's begin. Let's find or think back on some formulas that you've seen before. Do you remember the formula for the volume of a cylinder? We needed the area of the base, pi times the radius squared, multiplied by the height of the cylinder. Hopefully you remember the area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. And so these are examples of formulas that have a variable isolated on one side of the equation, right? The V here is all by itself and the A over here is all by itself. And other times you end up with formulas that don't have anything all alone. We saw uh, this law, fan law number three, talking about the relationship between the static pressure and the RPMs. And uh, let's see, do you remember Boyle's law? If you do, take a second and write it down and pause the recording. And if you don't, well, then follow along with me. Boyle's law says that the product of the pressure and the volume will remain constant whenever the temperature is constant. So we have P1 for the first pressure times V1 for the first volume is exactly the same as P2 times V2. There we go, Boyle's Law. When we solve a formula for a variable, this means we want to use some algebra. To isolate a variable. So if we went back up here and looked at this formula for the volume of a cylinder, we might say, I already know the base and I already know the volume. I just need to know what sort of height I need. For example, maybe you need to have a particular length of wire to create a certain amount of wire resistance. That might be a time when you'd want to solve this formula for H. Or maybe you want to know what the new pressure is going to be. And so then we would take this formula and solve for P sub 2. The process that we use is very, very similar to the process that we used when we were solving an equation. And so what we're going to do is look at Boyle's Law twice. Once when we know some numbers and once when we don't. All right. So Boyle's Law. You have it right above. I've got it on my sheet of paper. Um, I just can't show it to you here on the screen. I, oh, well, we can write it down, can't we? We'll just put it over here. Boyle's Law says P1 multiplied by V1 is equal to P sub 2 multiplied by V sub 2. So here, if we were going to use Boyle's Law to find the new pressure, we would fill in all of the known values into the formula. So that would be 30 PSI A multiplied by 50 cubic inches and that would be equal to P sub 2 multiplied by 40 cubic inches. And you know how to solve this. We did this ages ago and we've been doing it quite a bit um, 
back and forth as we've gone through all of these different lessons. If you want to find p sub 2, we just undo this multiplication and divide both sides by 40. And of course the 40s will cancel or divide out on the right hand side. And we have p sub 2 all by itself. And on the left hand side, well we just calculate 30 times 50 divided by 40 is 37.5. And I know we just got done talking about significant figures and converting measurements and things like that. And at the moment, I'm not going to pay attention to these just because that's not the point of the lesson here. You already know how to figure out this 37 and a half PSIA and you can round it from there where it needs to go. What we really want to do is come over here and figure out this new idea of solving a formula for a variable. It works the same way. If you want to isolate p sub 2, then we have to move v sub 2. And it's p sub 2 multiplied by v sub 2, so we just divide by it. The same way that we divided by the 40 over here, we'll divide by v sub 2 over there. We don't have to use any numbers at all. Whatever it is, we'll divide out on the right hand side. P sub 2 is left all alone. And it's worth P1 times V1 all divided by V2. So there, if you were in a position where you needed to calculate the new pressure all the time, then this would be a really handy formula to have around and it would save you from having to do this algebra over here over and over and over again. So that's the idea. We're just going to move the symbols around using algebra and not worry about the values anymore. We'll create new formulas from old ones. Okay, so let's flip the page and see what we have waiting for us. Here we go. The formula for the perimeter of a rectangle you know is twice the length times twice the width. And the job is to solve the formula for L. So we need to get L all by itself. So let's see what the algebra says here. 2L plus 2W. All right, so undoing, moving things away from the L. And we start by adding or subtracting things just like always. So we're gonna subtract 2W from both sides. Right, whatever we do to one side of the equation, we have to do to the other. You remember this big fat zero here? So we have 2L on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we don't have any like terms, so this just looks like P minus 2W. Great. Then what? Well, L is almost by itself. There's just this 2 here. How do we get rid of 2? Well, it's 2 multiplied by L. So we will divide, divide by two. And if you divide one side of the equation by two, we divide the other side of the equation by two. And the only thing you have to be careful of is that you extend this division bar here, that you're dividing the whole side of the equation. It's actually not even a bad idea to put some parentheses in here. Hold all of this together and divide the entire side by two. Twos cancel. And what is left over? L is equal to p minus 2w all divided by 2. And then of course we just rewrite it in the other direction. L is equal to p minus 2w divided by 2. So now if you happen to know the perimeter and the width, you could find the length directly. You could have done this algebra before if you had values. As a matter of fact, you have done this algebra before when you had values. But you don't want to do this algebra over and over and over and over again. It's nicer to have a formula handy for the things that you need often. All right, so let's come down to the bottom here. And you know, I think I'm gonna leave this one to you and just see what you can do on your own. And then we'll talk about it in a second. So pause the recording here, give it a try. 
Don't let that square bother you. Think about what needs to happen. Move the R first, and then decide what to do about the square. Then come back when you're ready, and we'll see how you do. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to get the R away from the E. Right now we have E squared divided by R, so we'll multiply by R on both sides. And of course on the right hand side, the R's divide out. And that leaves us with E squared by itself equal to R times P. How do you get rid of the square? Do you remember what undoes a square? Well, it's a square root. Square root of e squared. And of course, if you take the square root of one side, we need to take the square root of the other. The whole point was that the square root undoes the square, and that leaves the e all by, the self, by itself. What's the square root of r times p? I don't know. Doesn't matter. It's the square root of r times p. Just like that. So e is equal to? the square root of r times p. So someday this may be a useful formula for you. Let's flip the page and see what else we have. Oh, here we go. The amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance is given by this formula. Q is equal to C times M times T2 minus T1. Um, the C talks about the specific heat of the substance. The T2 and T1 are the initial time and the ending time. So we have a, of course, raising something's temperature takes a little bit of time. And the M is the mass of the substance. But we don't actually need to know that to accomplish our goal. Our job is to solve the formula for T sub 2. So let's see what we have here. Q is equal to C times M times T sub 2 minus T sub 1. T sub 2 is the thing we want. And so we have to move everything else away from T sub 2. How shall we do that and where shall we start? Well, I can't get rid of the T sub 1 here. I've got these parentheses holding it all together. Just like before, Let's undo the multiplication. C times M times this stuff in parentheses. So I can divide by C and I can divide by M. Of course, what I do to one side, I need to do to the other. But the C's will divide out and the M's will divide out. And that leaves us with Q divided by C M is equal to t sub 2 minus t sub 1. And I don't need the parentheses anymore because nothing's being multiplied by it. And now I'm going to stop and let you finish this because the job really is just to get t sub 2 all by itself and you should know how to do that. Pause the recording, work it out, and come back when you're done. I know, there wasn't a whole lot left to do, but I wanted you to do it anyway. To undo this subtraction, we need to add, add T1 to both sides. Um, if you like doing it vertically like this, that's okay. Me, I'm kind of running out of space a little bit, and I think it might be easier for you to see if I add it over here, plus T1, and add it over here plus T1. And that'll help keep things from getting all mixed up in the fractions. And of course we do that because there's a very big fat zero there. And so what we have when we're finally done is T2 is equal to T1 plus Q divided by CM. And we're done. See, it's not that bad. It feels a little weird because you don't have the numbers to push around, but it's nice. We don't have to worry about significant digits. We don't have to worry about adding or subtracting or long division or any of those things. We're just using a little bit of algebra. Algebra is your friend. All right.
our very last example here. Let's look at fan law two. The relationship between the RPMs and the static pressure. Okay, so our job here is to isolate SP2, the stuff underneath that square root. The first thing that we're going to have to do is move the square root of SP1. Then we can deal with the square root around SP2. And yeah, you know, I think I'm going to do that again to you. Try it. Pause the recording. Come back. See how it works. Okay, so let's start with our formula. And the first step, like we talked about a second ago, is to get rid of this square root of SP1 in the denominator. We want to move it away from the square root of SP2. So it's being divided right now. The way to move it is to multiply. And what we do to one side, we need to do to the other. Because, of course, this piece, whoops, that doesn't look very good, cancels with that piece. Now what do we have? We have the square root of SP2 is equal to the square root of SP1 multiplied by RPM2 all divided by RPM1. Okay, so far so good. Now what? How do you undo a square root? Well, we just did the other thing that was just about like this before. Square roots and squares undo each other. So if we take this side here and square it, that will get rid of the square root. And what you do to one side of the equation, we have to do to the other. Hold that whole thing in parentheses and square it. So now on the right hand side, sp sub 2 is all by itself. On the left hand side, well it's going to look a little messy. You could just leave it like this if you wanted to I suppose. Um, the other thing we can do is work with those laws of exponents that we had before. This square applies to everything inside of the parentheses. So the square acting on sp1 inside of a square root just gives us sp1 all by itself. A square acting on rpm2 gives us rpm2 squared. And the square acting on rpm1 gives us rpm1 squared. There we go. That's it. That is the end. The formula sp sub 2 has been isolated. And so now we just turn it around so it looks a little nicer. sp sub 2 is sp1 multiplied by rpm2 squared and divided by rpm1 also squared. And that's it. The end. So practice rearranging some formulas. And we will talk to you later. Have a great day. Bye-bye.